Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson. Joining me as always is my co-host, Bob Pastorella. How are you today? I am doing great, Michael. How are you doing? I'm good. I feel, in a way, as if we've just completed a marathon, because really... We've had a marathon conversation. We've just had over three hours with Jonathan Jans, and we've not only spoke about writing, but we've spoke about philosophy, we've spoke about religion, we've spoke about what it is to be a good human being. It's been great. Yes, it was thoroughly one deserving the title of EPIC, all caps, exclamation point. This is a three-hour conversation. and we. This is going to be a three-parter for sure. And I know that everyone's just going to love this stuff. We, we cover a vast, vast array of subjects. It's awesome. Awesome conversation. And here's the thing. In the earlier days, we used to do a lot more of these three-parters. But I've tried to limit it to two parters only but we just couldn't stop there were too many important things to cover That's i'm not right. sure when the last three parter was i have a feeling it was either adam neville or philip fracassi this is certainly the first three parter we've done in 2018 i think so i hope so because i've just <clears> said <throat> it now <laughs> <laughs> yeah that means that if if it's not, then we forgot about another epic podcast, and would that be really bad? Yeah, yeah, it would. No, yeah. I think the only <sighs> things that we've recorded that are even approaching three hours this year are our story unboxed and Patreons only episodes. Right. Which you can get over at www.patreon.com <laughs> forward slash this is horror. Yes, the Tony McMillan moment. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Speaking of sponsors, let's have a quick word from this episode's sponsors. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a St- Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com. Dot com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. Get ready to indulge in an audio experience that will make your skin crawl and your stomach churn. Sadistic experiments are being carried out in Arlington Asylum, designed to remake our world as a demonic Lovecraftian hellscape. Tormented, from horror author Lee Mountford and narrator Hannibal Hills, is now available as a high-quality audiobook. Search Tormented on Audible or Amazon now. Don't just read horror. Experience it. All right, and we're back, and I believe that you have Jonathan Jans's bio. Yes, I do. Jonathan Jans is the author of more than a dozen novels and numerous short stories. His work has been championed by authors like Joel Lansdale, Brian Keane, and Jack Ketchum. He is also lauded by Publishers Weekly, The Library Journal, and The School Library Journal. He is the author of Exorcist Falls, The Fortcoming, The Siren, and The Spectre, and his novel, Children of the Dark, was chosen by Booklist as a top 10 horror book of the year. His main interests are his wonderful wife and three amazing children. You can sign up for his newsletter, and you can follow him on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Amazon, and Goodreads. And that is Jonathan Jantz. Oh, yeah. And if you haven't read any of his fiction, you definitely should. And I think you will after this conversation. Oh, I agree. Yeah, he's... He is uh, one of the uh, rising stars. He's one of the best. And he's not really a rising star. He's got several books and a lot of his books are going to be re-released and we're going to get into that oh yeah this is old school horror with modern sensibilities there you go and with that said let's do it let us get mr jonathan jans on this is horror let's do it and now for a horror interview Jonathan, welcome to This Is Horror. 
Hey, thank you. I'm delighted to be on here, you two. This is going to be wonderful. Oh, we're delighted to have you here. And to begin with, I usually like to ask people about some of the early life lessons growing up. And I saw in your bio that you said you grew up between a dark forest and a graveyard. So naturally, <laughs> that is where we're starting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is a that is a good place to begin. It's funny, uh, I, I get asked sometimes, I'm sure every horror writer gets asked, you know, why do you write such twisted stuff? And I feel like with me, and this sounds like such a cliche, but I think it's so true. It's like the genre chose me rather than the other way around. It's not like I set out purposely to write twisted or scary or disturbing things. But when I was really little, yeah, I was four, three or four when we moved into that house. And it was on the edge of town. And there was a uh, this dark forest behind us, which always creeped me out. And then um, to the right of the house, as you looked at the street, there was a, uh, a big graveyard. And a lot of my childhood was spent playing in those two areas. And it wasn't like the other two sides, like the front of our house and the, and the, and the left side. It wasn't, wasn't like there was a lot of um, uh, civilization there either. So it was very isolated. And I was constantly frightened. I was a very fearful kid. And I think that my mind was always conjuring frightening scenarios, you know, what might pop out of the woods, what might rise from the dead. And uh, I just think that, that those, and, and to, to make matters worse or better, my mother has always been like a fan of like In Search Of, that old TV show that Leonard Nimoy ho hosted. And then, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and then also The Twilight Zone. And so we would always watch The Twilight Zone. And this is when I was like five or six. My parents got divorced when I was four, so it was just my mother and I, right? and <laughs> and our cat and then we would watch these scary shows and then i would imagine scary things so i've i've all i was kind of born into horror and there's a lot of different directions i could take the conversation <laughs> after that now <laughs> i wonder was there anything foreboding or scary about the house itself I mean, apart from the fact that there's a graveyard and a forest right near, which you would think would be scary enough. But yeah, I just wonder about the house's character or if there was anything off about the house. Yeah, they're, they're really, well, to a degree, yes. So we, we were really poor when I was growing up. And the house, the story that I was told was that it was like two grain bins that had been like connected via this, this kind of breezeway. And it was, I don't know how large it was, probably about 600 square feet. It was a tiny little house and maybe 500. And it had this really dank, scary basement with, you know, I, I, I used it in Children of the Dark, but I forget the name of it off a cistern. I think there's a cistern in the basement. Um, and I was always afraid that was the gateway to, to the underworld. And then there are a lot of things like that happened in the house that were scary. There was a woman next door, our one neighbor, who would, I think she had, you know, looking back, I think there were some issues with her uh, mentally. And she would just shriek and scream at all hours and then seem perfectly kind and normal when I'd see her like a day later. So that was disturbing. And then another thing that was really very frightening, my mother, so when she had me, she was young. She was 21 or so when she had me. And she was an Indiana Pacers cheerleader for the NBA. And so she was very attractive. She's still very pretty. She's in her 60s now. But when she and my father, my whatever you want to call him, biological dude, when, he, when they divorced, um, there were a lot of men. Remember, this is back in the, like the late 70s. And there were a lot of men in the small town who were obsessed with her and who would frankly stalk her. And, um, that was back in the days of, you know, well, police, you know, today, I, th I think society still can be very patriarchal, but back then it was far worse. And so she'd go, I mean, these men would call at all hours. They, they'd like look in our windows in the middle of the night and she would call the police and basically the response was, well, you know, boys will be boys. <laughs> you know, are they really harming anybody? Can you just cover up as you walk through the house? Those are the kinds of responses my mom would get. And so, so many times I remember vividly, I'd look up into the window at night and there'd be this leering face, this bearded face with these mad eyes staring in at me or trying to catch a glimpse of my mom. 
So there was a lot, I think, that <laughs> in addition just to the to the environment, that the, the the physical environment that made it a scary place to grow up. Man, that is truly yeah. awful. <laughs> what, yeah. what horrible things to have to endure. <laughs> I felt bad. I feel bad for my mom looking back. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't fun sometimes. And then you're living. I bet you the first time you saw Pet Cemetery, you were like, "This is my house." <laughs> Absolutely, man. I was gay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then the creepy neighbors. Oh my God, that's. I don't know. That's scary, man. Just I mean, just you know, real life can be a lot scarier than you know the horrors that we write, and that's just I don't know, man. It's uh, that's one of my things. I. I even in my house, you know, I, 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 and I'm a guy. If someone's in my backyard, I can tell. Uh, you know, if someone walks by my backyard, because I live in an apartment complex, so there's like maybe you know seven feet, and then there's a fence, and it's not a very solid fence. You know, there's gaps, and so occasionally I'll be laying on my side, and I'll just happen to look out the window, and someone will walk by, and man, I am up and looking at the blinds, go, Who, who's back there? <laughs> you know, realizing I don't have any weapons other than my fist. And I'm just like, okay, wait, this is really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I think that that kind of fear, I mean, that's a universal thing. And that's not, that's not about age. I think that that's always a fear of, you know, just something, something trying to invade your space, something with exactly with malicious intent. No, that's absolutely, I'm, I'm still the same way. Uh, I, I still, you know, have that. I, I think that still lingers, and I think that would be the case no matter how I grew up. Yeah, I think it's it's a universal thing. It's a, you know, it doesn't affect it. It's age doesn't affect it. Gender doesn't affect it. Nothing affects it. It's just it's it's that I don't know. It's that real life creep thing that just. Phew, uh. No, exactly. And I think that's also you know people they often wonder okay why people love horror why we love scary books, why we love scary movies. And I'm, I'm not going to say this as eloquently as others have. There are a lot of quotes about this. I think Stephen King talks about how essentially we, we read these things and watch these things to help us kind of deal with real horrors. You know, because, you know, honestly, a, a, a werewolf in a book, that's not nearly as scary as, you know, as, as something that could happen in real life, like, you know, like, like racism, right? Somebody being being persecuted because of the color of his or her skin. That's true horror, right? That's truly frightening. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you know, somebody breaking into your house at night, that's truly scary. And that's always a possibility, right? And it seems like w increasingly as society, you know, we, we move forward in some ways, but we devolve in other ways. I think that those are the horrors that, that we try to take refuge from right and sometimes those are the horrors we also work out on the page but i think that that real life is infinitely more frightening than, than books and movies right i think recently nadia balkan wrote a very very good article about it and basically succinctly what she put it you know is why why does she like that stuff because it's a coping mechanism i totally agree i need to read her by the way i've heard so many good things culture <laughs> Say, saying some good things about her work. I need to read it, but she's, she's spot on. I mean, that's exactly, mm -hmm. it is a coping mechanism. I mean, I right. do think it makes me personally, it makes me emotionally and mentally healthier. A, to get that stuff out on the page, but then B, to read about it and work those issues out on the page. I think that makes me more equipped to deal with life. Right, exactly. That, I think that's the point that she was trying to get at because she is, and, and you can tell, a real true horror fan because we're the ones that are sitting that, that have watched so many horror movies and the tensions going on a movie. And it's like, she said, she's the, the one she loves this because she's the hiding behind her popcorn. <laughs> and that, and that's me. I mean, I've seen so many movies and I'll sit there and stare at stuff, but when the tension, when it, when they get it right, I will actually hold my hand up and go, oh, okay, hold on. Whoa, 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 wait, I'm going to look at this with one eye. Because <laughs> sometimes I, I don't want to, uh, and, and that means, and, and I'm thinking to myself, you scaredy cat, <laughs> you know, but it's, yeah, I'm scared. <laughs> that man, that's, that's doing its job though. If it, if it elicits that kind of response from you. Oh yeah. Yeah. And isn't it remarkable that we can watch so many horror films and we can read so many horror books. And then occasionally there is something that you see and it's so terrifying 
that you're actually looking away. I mean, yes. like, like you say, that is the mark of a fantastic film right there. Exactly. Right. No, that's absolutely true. I mean, that is true success. That is that is that is art, right? It's yeah. twist sounds, that's successful art. Right. And on that note, I mean, what do you think in the past, let's say, couple of years have been the horror movies or indeed the movies that have really affected you? And it could be because of that. It could be because of the way they've told a story. It can be anything, really. Yeah. Um, I tell you what, here, here's an irony that I want to get out of the way right now. And that is, is that because I've had children, uh, my son just turned 13. One daughter is just turned 11 and the other daughter is seven. Um, so they're still relatively young. And because of that, I, I haven't seen, since, since they've been alive, really that many of the horror movies that have been released in the last 13 years. I've seen some, of course, um, but usually when I see those, those are when I'm alone, and I'm not alone that often. If I'm alone, I'm usually writing a novel. Um, so I've seen some, but I'm just not, I, I don't have the kind of exhaustive um, intimacy with the last 13 years of horror that I should and will because now that my son's 13, we're starting to get into them and watch them together, which is amazing. But here are just a couple over the last couple of years. So th th first of all, this sounds probably you know unoriginal, but I loved it. I thought I thought the it adaptation was was really really good. I thought that one one definition I've heard of, of and I don't know if this is uh, probably not a universal definition, but some people uh, say this that if if a if a horror story is truly wonderful, you can take out the horrific elements and there's still a good story there. So you still care about the characters. And I feel like it accomplished that. Like I really cared about the Losers Club. It didn't hurt that I love the novel. But I really cared about the kids, Beverly Marsh particularly, the young lady, who I forget the actress's name, but man, she was, she just knocked me over with her performance so good. I thought she should have gotten nominated for Best Supporting Actress. But I was really pleased with that adaptation. I thought that they, they distilled what was great about King's novel. And obviously there are some changes to the adaptation, but I thought it was true enough to the spirit of it to work. And I like that there are two movies also, and I don't think that was a money grab. I just don't think you can make that, whatever, 1,100-page story into a two-hour movie. So I was really happy that they made it into two movies. I think the second one's going to be good. Another one that came to mind as you asked that question was uh, It Follows. Oh, and, yeah. And, and, and I really, cool. really dig that one just because of, you know, there's something so elemental something so primal and simplistic about something following you something inexorable something that that you cannot evade no matter what you do sure you might put distance between you and it but you can never completely escape and that's what it follows made me feel and i just love that i love those sequences it was it was basically like 95 minutes of creeping suffocating dread and I think that's an accomplishment. You talk about that, 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 that visceral response that horror movies can, can evoke in us. And I really think that It Follows succeeded in that, both because of the direction. I thought the sound design of that film was brilliant. I thought the lead actress was fantastic. So I was really impressed by that one. Yeah, and I think hitting on the sound design, really, I mean, that was a vital part of the movie. And it's such an unsettling soundtrack as well. And I'd it say, is. sorry, go on. No, 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 I agree. I was just agreeing with you. It is. Yeah, and I, I'd say as well, I mean, It Follows was quite an original concept. And I think we're finding more and more these days that, you know, the horror movies that are particularly successful or particularly appeal to listeners, I guess, of this show are those where they're doing something a little bit different. So A Quiet Place would be another example of that. Uh, I love, love, love A Quiet Place. Probably if I had to choose my two favorite of the last couple of years, it would be A Quiet Place and then Get Out. Those oh, are the two. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Those, I'd say, tower above 
everything. Uh, I mean, just be exactly because of what you're talking about. There's something, there's something so original. And, and that's the thing. It's like, yeah, it, you can find connections to other films and stories, but they take these ideas and then they take them in new directions. There have been horror movies that have made comments on, on, you know, the state of race relations mm -hmm. in the world. Like, you know, Night of the Living Dead did that back in 1968, I believe to a degree. Right. So we have, we have racism mixed in with horror, but, 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 but get out takes that to a different level, which is extraordinary. And in a quiet place, you talk about, you know, really elevating the, the, the art of sound, fully art and film and fully exploiting that. And then John Krasinski's wonderful direction. I was just blown away by a quiet place. Yeah. I completely agree with everything you mm -hmm. said there. I really do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, those two films are, uh, they're definitely at the top. Uh, uh, and it's people at the top of their game, too. That's And that's what I really like, you know, especially Jordan Peele. I mean, as soon as it was announced that he was going to hit up the new Twilight Zone, uh, you <laughs> know, uh, for CBS, and and, and and people, you know, and people are like, oh, I hope it's good. I'm like, I don't, it's going to be good. Yes. <laughs> you, know? yeah. I mean, you, can't, you can't miss, you know. I mean, it can, but, you know, it's, <sighs> I'm just, I'm ready for it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Me too. He's, he's so, he's such a, such a, just a, a nuanced and just such a sharp, incisive storyteller, really, that, that, that has mastered every element of the craft. You're right. It's going to be good. I think it's just a matter of how good, right? It's either going to be good or it's going to be transcendent, right? And that's not a bad mm -hmm. range which to, in which to sit. But I think it's going to be somewhere in that spectrum of <laughs> very, very positive. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think there hasn't really been a more ideal time to relaunch the Twilight Zone. I mean, if you look <laughs> at the climate that we're living in politically, culturally, yes. and I mean, you add to that the success of Black Mirror, which I would say really is almost like an unofficial companion to the Twilight Zone. It does have something of the Twilight Zone about it. So throw in all of those ingredients then throw in Jordan Peele. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we're ready for it. We really are. I've got to see Black Mirror. I'll be totally honest here. I've, I, I've not watched it, again, for the same reason I alluded to earlier. I've heard that the episodes, they're, they're, they're very self-contained, right? Yeah, yeah, it, completely. I think yeah, I think that's so cool. And, and at some point, I'll start watching that series because I've heard not, really nothing but excellent things about it. So, yeah, I can't, I can't wait to check it out. And I think what's really interesting about Black Mirror is how relevant it is to the time that we're living in and mm. also how varied each episode is. So there are different themes that you'll see across the seasons and across the episodes. So he'll often talk about technology. He'll talk about artificial intelligence. He'll talk mm. about social media there's usually one that is more of a nod towards old school horror. And mm. then you'll also see, I guess, more real life horror. You'll see more kind of just horrible people. <laughs> um, <laughs> the kind of thing that you might imagine Jack Ketchum would have written about and indeed that he did uh. write about. So, I mean, uh. it it's not, I guess it doesn't market itself as, a horror show and it's like the twilight zone in that sense that it touches on so many different subgenres within what we would just call genre fiction and it's masterful storytelling it really is well if i wasn't if i wasn't sold before i'm quadruply sold now and even more so after you uh, mentioned Jack Ketchum, my goodness, how, how much, oh, I love that. I love that man. I miss him so much. Dallas mayor. Uh, any, any, anytime you, you use that name, man, I'm there. I'm the, I'm the first in line. <laughs> yeah, me too. And I mean, we, we've spoken about Dallas a number of times on the show. Of course we have. He's such a influential writer, but such a, a nice human being as well. I mean, I had a few interactions with him via email and despite 
his success and despite his mastery, he always had the time for anyone. And I don't know anyone who's got a bad word to say about the guy. Great writer, great person. And yeah, as you say, we miss him. Yeah, no, that's exact. I love, I love the way you said that. It's so true. There's a. I, I keep coming up with these like platitudes today. I'm sorry about all these pla- uh, these quotes, but there's one, and it reminds me of Jack Ketchum, Dallas Mayor, and, and it's basically you can tell, you can tell a lot about a person by the way he or she treats those from whom he or she has nothing to gain. And you look at you look at Dallas. He he didn't have anything to gain from from me, right? Right. And, and, you know, like, you know, folks, you know, most folks are are not as well known as he is. And, and frankly, most will never be as well known as he is. He is an absolute legend. So he didn't have anything to gain by being as as generous as he was. But he was he was so kind and, and, and responsive and communicative and, and open with his advice he he's he's the kind of person who could just change your life with an email or a conversation, and that's a that's a really rare gift. And I, he, we're all better for having known him and had him. Uh, just a, an amazing human being. Yeah, and I remember that he said if he could kind of have a line or something for people to remember, it would be the Greek for "go with the good." And go with the good is such a fantastic way to live your life. And to be honest, whenever I'm having struggles or something is difficult or I'm having a rough day, I think about that. And when you have choices to make, go with the good. It's not going to steer you wrong. That's fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. And then and leave it to Dallas to so eloquently and, and, and you know, in such a streamlined manner, state that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that's why that's how he was. He gave me one of the best pieces of writing, writing advice I've ever heard. And because I, I remember I, I met him at Scares the Care. We'd been corresponding via email for a while. And just as you're talking about it, he was so responsive, so kind. But I finally got to meet him, and I was just, I was literally dizzy. I I, I was trying not to faint because it's like meeting, you know, some people don't get it. You know, for some people, it's it's like a movie star or a a politician. You know, for for people, my ultimate would be to meet this, would be to meet Stephen King. But Jack Ketchum was right there at the top, near the top for me. And so when I met him, I was just trying not to, like, drool or pass out. And, and he was really great at relaxing me and, and, and putting me at my ease. But then I, as we were talking about writing and you know, building a career, I was talking about this insecurity and that insecurity and all these things that I was afraid of. And he looked at me. And I, I'm not going to say the, the 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 F word here because we might get into this later. But I'm a teacher. I use profanity in my fiction, but on on you know different podcasts and different interviews, I try not to cuss. And so uh, his his response was F uh, fear. Yeah. Right? He, he he said you know, so. I'll just say screw. He says screw fear. And I kind of blinked and stared at him. He goes seriously, screw it. What 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 has it ever done for you? And I kind of just, you know, spluttered and stared at him. He goes, no, I'm, I'm being honest. What has fear done for you? How has fear helped you? How has being insecure advanced you in any pursuit? And I, I started to think about that. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> he's right. <laughs> so, and it's funny. It's like whenever I start to get a little uncertain, okay, is this book going to get bad reviews? Or is this, is this editor going to dislike this thing that I've sent him or her? I just remember that advice. And as simplistic as it sounds it gets me over it i'm like you're right you know what why yeah the person might not like it but why live through it twice right if the person doesn't like it he or she isn't going to like it why worry about it and then have to deal with it again later so so screw fear just 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 push through it don't be afraid you know be intrepid that's what dallas would do and and that's helped me immeasurably in the last four or five years since i talked to him yeah well it makes a tremendous amount of sense and it Reminds me of, I actually read an interview of you recently, and I saw that you'd said to gravitate toward do 
and avoid getting too hung up on don't. So I wonder yes. I, I wonder if that was something inspired by Dallas, because it sounds like it's going along similar lines at least. A hundred percent it is. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It's like if you're worried, if you're constantly worried about making mistakes, that's going to become oppressive, suffocating. And that's not how all of this, that's not how life should be, right? Forget fiction for a moment, but that's not how we should live our lives. It, it's a Morgan Freeman in, in Shawshank Redemption said it's a terrible thing to live in fear. And, and that, that's so true. And of course, some fear is unavoidable. Some fear might even be healthy, right? I think it's probably a little healthy that I'm fearful of something happening in my family because that makes me more protective and, and aware and vigilant. But to live in fear, to constantly be paralyzed, debilitated by terror of everything, of, of failure, of whatever, I think that's an unhealthy way to live. And, I, and I, I think that's that's very confining. And I think that we should, as much as possible, strive to do the opposite. And certainly, as writers and, and creators, we should certainly try not to be, you know, totally ruled by fear. Yeah, and I think that's an important distinction and perhaps something we can look at even further. So, absolutely terrible thing to live in fear. There are going to be things that you will fear but i guess the best way to go about that is to okay look at why do i fear this is this rational what can i do to best avoid the thing that i fear and then once mm. you've done the best things that you can do there's not a lot of point dwelling on it because you have taken the actions that you could take um if something happens you know that you did your best yeah, that that's beautifully said, and that that's and I think that reminding oneself of that is so crucial because I'm I'm a second guesser of myself, and 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 remembering exactly what you just said really helps kind of ameliorate that tendency that I have, and it really helps me. I think again, I beat myself up less, and I can I can go on and actually maybe breathe a little bit rather than always feeling like I'm going to make a mistake or have made a mistake. And of course I have. I've made too many mistakes to count. But like you said, knowing that you've done your best, I think it goes a long way toward alleviating that kind of that cycle of that perpetuating guilt and, and frustration and, and self-recrimination. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you said you've made too many mistakes to count. I think fear and failure can go alongside one another and particularly fear of failure so i think that's why really you have to be comfortable with failure once you accept that you are going to fail and you're going to fail numerous times i mean it was samuel beckett who said fail fail again fail better once you're comfortable <laughs> with that i think it actually removes some of the fear so, I mean, if we're to take this in terms of writing, perhaps you're afraid of submitting to an anthology or a magazine or even just submitting your first story for people who are just starting out. And, you know, why are you afraid? You're afraid because of rejection and because you might then uh, kind of confuse rejection with failure. We'll just accept the rejection and failure, if you want to call it that. I mean, I think that's quite unhealthy. Um, but rejection is just a learning process, and it's something to become comfortable with. And once you accept that, then you're less afraid of it, and it doesn't hold that power over you. But if you're not submitting, then that fear has got control of you, not the other way around. So true. So true. Rejection, and it's so hard to view it this way because it is so crushing. It is so uh, disappointing. But rejection means that you tried. Rejection means that you had courage. And it means that you endeavored to do something. I think the biggest regrets, yeah, we can regret our actions. But I think so often what we end up regretting is inaction. Is, yeah. is, is not doing something that we know deep down that we should have done, not attempting something that we know we should have attempted. I, and I'll, I'm sure I'll still get rejected, and, and I, I, it's, it's a certainty, right? Because I'm gonna keep 
endeavoring. I'm going to keep trying. So yeah, I still get rejected. But when I was starting out, that was all I had. That was all I had. People talk about wallpapering an office with rejection. I could wallpaper a city with the rejections that I got. I was rejected by everybody numerous times and often very cruelly, right? And back then it just felt like I was failing. I was the worst writer in the world. But looking back, I'm actually sort of proud at that spirit that I exhibited because I kept going, right? I kept going. I didn't let that stop me. I did I did let it depress me, <laughs> but I didn't let it stop me. And that that meant that even even in that, you know, terrible time, in that unsuccessful time, I was exhibiting a form of courage. Right. I think all you need is hope. Even mm -hmm. if it's just a small amount of hope, if you've got that glimmer of light, that is what keeps you going. Exactly. Well, it's all part of being human. I mean, you, you, when you face rejection, if it depresses you, you, you're being human. I think that the main thing is, is that, you know, you can become, you know, stress is the number one killer. Uh, stress kills more people than anyone else. You can uh, become stressed out because you're because of fear. And then you can also be stressed out because you know that stress is the number one killer and you fear <laughs> that. OK, so, yeah, it's perpetuating. It, 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 it feeds upon itself. And I think a lot of times that for some people, you know, if you don't feel sadness or, or you know, or, or a sting of rejection, especially on a story, then then you're not human if you don't feel it. You're supposed to feel that, but you have to move on. And you have to have kind of like a screw it attitude, yes. you know, and, and I have found in my in, in my lifetime that I excel in most cases, when I finally have that, you know, oh, well, whatever, you know, attitude, because right. I relax. <laughs> it makes the fear go away. Yes. And so at the same time, you know, my, much to the dis dismay of my bosses and everything, they're like, you, you have to be focused. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to focus on that. I'm just going to do what I do, <laughs> you know, and then, and then I'm successful and they're like going, well, he just does what he does. And of course, you know, up, people higher than that, they want to try to measure that. I'm like, you can't measure that. Right. Because you're not me, you know, same thing applies to writing. You know, I've recently had some struggles with stuff and I'm at the point now to where, you know, oh, well, I just got to, I just got to write, you know, I mean, it's just got to do it, you know. Uh, giving myself a lot of permission to suck and just do it. <laughs> that's my favorite. That's my favorite writing advice of all time. Mike Myers, give yourself permission to suck. The guy yeah. who you know, Austin Powers, whatever. I, Shrek. I love that advice. That's exactly right. And you know, another thing you're alluding to there is is individualization, and, and I, that's one glorious part of of being human. Is that you know you are have learned and are still probably learning as I am as we go through this, right? What works best for you and your mm -hmm. bosses are, are probably confounded by your process, but but you know how you best succeed. You know how you best work and 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 individualize that, and and knowing that kind of liberates you and frees you to go in that direction, right? And it makes no sense to them, but then again, their process probably makes no sense to you. And that's wonderful. That's great. And, and, and you know, you have that self-knowledge to know what, what, in, in what mode and mindset you best succeed. And then you can go that way and embrace that. That's, a, that's an amazing feeling. Yeah, it's very freeing. I mean, you have to, and for some people, I can, I can understand how it wouldn't be freeing if they're like, hey, yeah, I tried that screw it attitude, man. And that just didn't work. Right. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't leave the house for a week. You know? <laughs> I was like, well, you know, some, for some, everybody is going to be different. Uh, you know, and you, you, what you have to do is, is I guess to not fear experimentation on, on what, what's going to work for you. You've got to, you've got to try different things for some people. They become more fearless by being more structured. Mm hmm. Yes. In, in other words, they realized that, okay, well, wait a second. I was way too loose with this. Let me try a little, maybe kind of tighten this up a little bit and try this. And for some, I could see them going all the way to the extreme. It's like, nope, I have to do it this way, this way, this way, this way. And it makes me 100% confident and I'm able to execute, you know. So everyone's going to be different. I think you got to have that freedom 
to to be willing to try different things. Uh, and for me, it's just, you know, uh, and sometimes procrastination just really gets, I get the best work done that way. I'm sorry. Just, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's just the way it is. <laughs> Yeah, no, I you know, I hate to get too philosophical here on you, but but I think you know there's this there are these universal urges that that, that basically all people have or most people have. You know, I think for example, I think we all have this desire for control, right? People, if you, if you have five people in a room, they all want to hold the remote control. But I think this right. other desire that we have is acceptance, and I think that one one inhibitor of that can be this fear of being different right we're afraid to, to to be set apart from others in a negative way and what that ends up doing is it it, it it makes us resist being ourselves because if we are ourselves that means that we are by definition different we are unique and i think that once you let go of that this fear you know because i can't write like stephen king i can't write like Mary San Giovanni. I can't, because I, I am not those people. I am myself. And when I give that desire up of writing like this person or that person, that's when I can be different. And that's a wonderful, positive thing. Because we go, you know, I go back to my childhood and it's like, oh my gosh, I had to adhere to this this expectation. I had to be like this peer group. And, and I, you know, and in trying to be like other people, I think those are the moments when I was most miserable. And it's when we finally embrace our individuality, our, our otherness, you know, in, in whatever way we're different. I think that that's when we can start to really accept ourselves and be happy and, and also, I think, make others happy. You mentioned we talked about Dallas earlier. Dallas was unique. You know, I can't be Dallas. You can't be exactly like that. No one can be exactly like he was. But I think he was so unique and such a positive influence in others' lives because he knew himself and he was totally at home in his own skin. And I think that he, knowing that he was this way, he was this individual, I think that's one of the things that made him so special. And even though we're not like him exactly, we can be like him in that way. We can be ourselves and, and be happy with ourselves and in that way influence others. Yeah, that's, I would, I 100% agree with that. Yeah, definitely. And I think... Sorry, sorry so, for running off the rails there, but... No, <laughs> no, this, this is... This is really good, and this is really important, and I think not just for writing, but for living. And, I mean, in all these conversations, we will certainly get a little bit deeper than just writing advice. So what you're dishing <laughs> out here, I mean, this is good advice for life. And, you know, when you ask someone what is the best writing routine or what is the best fitness routine, as you say, it's what works best for you. So if you say, what's the best routine? It's the routine you stick to. That's yes, the best yes. routine. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's so well said. I give my, I teach creative writing. One of the classes I teach is in, in, in high school and junior high. And I give them two writing rules. I say the rest are guidelines. There are only two rules. One is don't bore the reader. And the other one is if it works, it's right. And that, that second point speaks to exactly what we're talking about there, right? You can, you can try to pack your head full of rules, right, these things, and chisel, chisel them in granite. But the fact is, if it works, it's right. And there are really limitless possibilities. And, and that goes only for writing, but for a lot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you said some of the times when you found yourself most miserable have been perhaps in writing when you've adhered to expectation and I know that you know early on I might limit the type of things that I was writing particularly when I was studying creative writing at university because there was more a kind of attitude to write things in a more literary vein and in less of a commercial genre fiction vein and genre fiction was perhaps looked down upon and so I'd be writing things that weren't really my authentic self. So because they weren't authentically me, I wasn't particularly happy. I wasn't bringing anything unique to the table. And as soon as I thought, you know, write what is you, be true to yourself, be authentic, then it improved. And you know what? Yeah, there will be some people who won't like what you're doing, but it's like anything. That is why... 
you know, taste is subjective and we have different types of writing, we have different films, we have different types of music and the only thing you can write is the work that is authentically you and maybe somebody has told you that to write literary fiction is better than let's say horror or science fiction or whatever it is that you feel comfortable writing but if you feel comfortable writing it then that is what you write added to which it's a load of bollocks to say that literary or anything is better than something else anyway because the taste being subjective (laughs) <laughs> preach man that is I, I couldn't agree i'm sitting here nodding my head i couldn't agree more with everything you just said and and that's the thing i, I think that you know in in my fiction and i'm not saying this to elevate myself in my fiction i have you know I, I i it naturally occurs it's organic but there's you know there's symbolism there's foreshadowing that there, there are all the, there there's subtext there's sometimes even social commentary but those things happen organically having said that uh, I have encountered snobbery before, and it's from exactly the kind of minds and attitudes you're talking about. I remember at Purdue, I was applying, I was about 27, I think, and or 26 or 27, and I'd, uh, I'd gotten, and I love Purdue University. It's right over here. It's about four blocks away. I did my undergrad work there, got my master's there. I did post-master's work there. That sounds like I'm a, a, a mailman, but anyway, I, I, I loved, I love that university. I want my kids to go there but i remember trying to take this specific class it was a creative writing class right and it was and i'd never had a class in creative writing and i think the classes i think you can have good classes in creative writing but it was this you know this post with this graduate class or whatever and you had to submit a, a writing sample and i submitted it and uh <laughs> <laughs> I'll never, I think I saved it. I, I, I got to dig that out. I think I have it somewhere. The response was basically, well, some people might like that, the sort of thing that you write, but we try to go a little deeper in this program, right? And it was basically that it wasn't literary enough. I can almost imagine the, the, that, that professor, and I won't, I won't shame him here. I'm not going to name and shame, but basically is like, I could imagine him with his, you know, he was nothing against tea, uh, my wife loves tea, but I could imagine him with his teacup, you know, and his pinky in the air, you know, and his nose turned up at me, right? Snobbly, you know, sniffing at what I had written that was beneath contempt, beneath his level, right? He'd sullied himself by reading my work, and I just wasn't quite on his level. That, like you said, that is such bollocks. I, I just, I, I, I have to laugh. Back then, I was wounded. Now, I just kind of feel sorry for that elitism right that that elitist lens through which he saw the world because how much was he missing out on right how much has he missed out on to make his little world that tiny that minuscule that he can only accept these few little authors these few little types of books um because they were purposely oblique because there's they're purposely inscrutable and incomprehensible Uh, i and i love some literary fiction but 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 i don't love snobbery Right. And that's that's the place from which he was coming. Right. And I think a lot Mm -hmm. of people like that. Their misconception is that literary and horror fiction have to be two distinct modes. Well, as we've said many, many times on This Is Horror. No, they don't. And oh, my gosh. Y- yeah, go, go, go get the, the Fisherman by John Langan. Right, right. right. You, mm-hmm. you can be literary and entertaining. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. And you know what? I can't write exactly like John because I'm not, I'm not he, right? And I love the way he writes. Um, but, but there's an example where the two fuse together, and they, can, they fuse together in many other authors as well. They're not two distinct circles on a Venn diagram, right? Liter- horror can be as literary as any other genre, sometimes more. And, and, and I just let people are so dismissive of horror, right? Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and to be mm-hmm. honest, I mean, if you're a writer that writes more towards literary fiction, if you're someone who writes more towards, let's say, pulp fiction with less literary sensibilities, 
start reading the one that you're not writing because both schools of thought, both styles can learn from the other. And indeed, when there's a mix of both, I think that's often when the best results are created. I mean, John Langan being a fantastic example, Craig Davidson, another one, um, Craig Clevenger as well. I think the work of A.M. Holmes, especially The End of Alice, I mean, holy shit, that is a very bleak book. Um, and I think perhaps because she usually wrote in more literary circles, that might have <laughs> you know, landed her in some trouble or like, you know, people were a little bit shocked by that. So if you haven't read The End of Alice, you need to <laughs> check it out. But it's definitely I, not a feel good I, story. <laughs> I haven't read it, and it's going to go to the top of my to-be-read pile now. Cause it sounds wonderful, but I've not read that one. Yeah. The whole, the whole thing with when you talk about literary snobbery. I mean, I'm just going to go ahead and, and and spell it out for people. That is a learned behavior from 150 years of criticism, which began by someone who was actually a jerk who couldn't do, and those that cannot do often criticize. <laughs> And that's that's the end of it. it. When you're five years old or four years old and you start to read, there is not a single child in the world who's like, I do not want to read Bob all the elephant. I would like to read this dissertation on, you know, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It is a learned behavior. I think as well, it, and I know that people say this often, but so many times, I mean if you're spending more time criticizing other people than actually creating or doing things for yourself, it usually does mm -hmm. show that there's a deep frustration and there's a deep sadness in your own life. And I know it's almost cliche to say that, but there's a lot of truth to it. If I'm spending my time trying to burn down others rather than build up myself, I think it's because I'm frustrated about what I'm doing and about what I'm creating. So instead of doing that, why don't I work on improving myself and improving my own art rather than, you know, shitting over somebody else's <laughs> art. And it, it, yeah. it's totally okay for somebody to create art that I do not enjoy. Again, it goes back to taste being subjective. It's okay mm -hmm. for me to not like something. It doesn't mean that it's terrible. It just means that it isn't for me. That's it. Right. Yeah, so true. What you both said is so true. Um, you know, Ratatouille, the Pixar movie, uh, at the end, I think it's Peter O'Toole who plays Anton Ego, the the food critic. But mm -hmm. in the end, you know, he he kind of has this epiphany about exactly what you're talking about, and he he you know he stops he basically. Sorry to spoil it, but he ceases to be such a snob, and he realizes that this idea uh, of of criticism sometimes being a, a negative. You know, because, you know, there is a valid place for criticism in the world, but but it depends on from where it comes, right? If you go into something hoping you're going to hate it, which many people do, then like you said, then you really need to take stock of your own approach and your own mindset. You know, why are you that miserable? Why are you spending your energy trying to tear down others who are trying to do something good? You know, and we go back to something, you know, we're talking about the, the John Langan, you know, there's so many different, there's room for everybody, right? And then like Joe R. Lansdale, um, I look at his writing and, and it's seemingly, you know, the language, you don't have to scramble for the, for the thesaurus, right? Or the dictionary to go, to go figure out what he's saying. You can, you can read his work and it seems very simple on the surface, but then you start to go under Joe R. Lansdale's work, you look under the hood and there's so much profundity there. There's so much meaning, right? There's so much social commentary. So there are a million ways in which in, in, in any author of quote unquote literary fiction could learn a great deal from Joe R. Lansdale because he has so much to say and he says it so beautifully. Um, and then, you know, and I'm, Lansdale would be the first to say that, you know, he could, he could, you know, I'm sure he does. He goes and reads, reads a guy like Cormac McCarthy, for instance, and I'm sure finds something of worth in that, even though their styles are completely different. Anyway, I love what you both just said. I think it's so true. Yeah, and I mean, 
Joe R. Lansdale, what a guy to bring up. And I think like Dallas, <laughs> this is another guy who's not only an absolute master of his craft, but again, very generous with his time. I mean, we spoke with him on this podcast for a couple of hours. He didn't need to be on This Is Horror. He didn't need to speak with us. He didn't need to impart such wisdom. And yet mm -hmm. he did. And, you know, I'm sure because of how big a name Joe is, I'm sure that he did us more good than we did him. But, mm -hmm. you know, he, he will do that because he's a generous guy and he'll do it for podcasts that are smaller than us. He'll do it for websites. He'll do it for anyone who wants his help because that's the kind of guy that he is. And mm -hmm. boy, what a storyteller. And I think this is actually coming back to something that Bob and I were speaking about off air because he does have a very simple, a very minimalist style, but it kind of goes back to that quote where it's like, well, I wrote a long letter because I didn't have time to write a short one and to, to get it that pared down. Yeah, it takes real mastery of craft. That's that's so true. Jo Joe is an American treasure and actually a worldwide Ooh. treasure. Um, he's somebody that I will I will champion for as long as I live because I, I love his work so much. And what's so wonderful, you guys both you know sound like you feel the same way. He is a prince of a human being. He is so just kind and, and, and generous. And it's like I love reading his work because not only is it endlessly entertaining and illuminating, it's also I know that I'm supporting a fabulous person. And, wow. and, I, mm -hmm. and I don't know about you guys, but for me, that makes a difference. Yeah, and sometimes I'm sure I've read work. I've read the work of jerks before. I've read the work of people who aren't very kind. But when I know somebody is a wonderful person, that 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 gives me a little extra um, nudge in that direction to read that person's work, and he certainly qualifies. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's so strange to be talking about Joe because I was in the same room with him yesterday. What? At a book signing. Yeah. Yeah, it's my actually second time to meet him within like three months. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, and uh, he was there with uh, with Casey, his daughter, at a book yeah. signing, and because they had the the Dana Roberts book that's out, mm -hmm. and uh, which is re sounds really good. And uh, and sure. you're right, he is so generous with his time. He is as pleasant a person as you would ever expect. He's just always just. Just very, very generous with his time, very kind, uh, and extremely knowledgeable. He, he and he is he is a living legend. He knows everyone in the business. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing. Uh you mention a name to him, he, he you know, he'll you know, he'll he'll be like, Oh yeah, I met him when I was in Italy, you know, and boy, he was he's really nice too. He likes to do little cups of coffee and everything, you know. And he's just <laughs> he's always got these little stories, you know, and it's just it's he's it was great having him on the show, uh, and you know, and, and I'm not like I said, I'm not trying to brag. I just happened to be in the right place, right time, you know. And uh, I chatted with him yesterday. I'm gonna be, uh, he's gonna be at KillerCon next week. I'm gonna be at KillerCon, so uh, you know, it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm dying. I'm dying to go. I want to go so badly. It's like my kids' schedules are so busy that I don't think I can make it down to Austin. But that's gonna be incredible. KillerCon is, and you know, you talk about Joe. Um, he, he is, he, he's everything you said he is. And, but what I love is kind as he is, there are a few things he doesn't have any, he doesn't have any use for or patience for. And those things are, you know, sexism, racism, yeah, uh, right, homophobia. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have time for those things or patience for those things. And I, and I love all, I also love that about him is that as loving a person as he is, his heart is absolutely gold. Um, he also, I think, make I think he makes the world a better place by what he doesn't tolerate. Yeah. You know, in the the Happ and Leonard books, you get that. You get, and they're so wildly entertaining. But you also, and this is this is again, this is the kind of thing you miss 
if you dismiss him as just this, you know, good old colloquial storyteller, right? And I think that's easy to do. You did a perfect voice impression of him a moment ago, right? And I think that mm-hmm. people make snap, snap and, and, and you weren't in any way judging him. You're just doing a perfect impression. But people tend to make snap judgments based on somebody's mannerisms or their voice or their style or whatever. And he just seems like this, you know, when you, when you, I, I watched him on YouTube and I finally got to meet him uh, a couple times. But I think that it'd be very easy to look at him and, and, and see him as this, you know, ah, shucks, you know, I'm just, I'm always nice and that kind of thing. And he is always nice until, until he sees injustice. And man, then the, the, the claws and the teeth come out. And Joe, Joe's got bite. And he shows that bite in his fiction, you know. And I'm and I'm sure he could show it in real life because he's he's this master martial artist who who invented his own form of martial arts. Yeah, right? yeah. So too it's right. Like, oh yeah. He seems to be this just this kind, gentle, you know. But he's also a lion, and I respect that so much about him. He could destroy just about anybody on the street, <laughs> and right. he probably would. He probably would if he saw that sort of prejudice taking place. And he destroys those prejudices with his fiction, or at least he draws attention to them. And I and I respect that about him so much. But yeah, you talk about not only one of my favorite writers, one of my favorite human beings, yeah. Joe Orlando. Oh yeah. And when we spoke with him, I mean, we had, like I say, two hours of conversation. We were talking about his life growing up in Texas. We were talking about his writing and, you know, we're just like soaking all of that in. And then we asked him for, I think it was towards the end, we were talking about final thoughts or wisdom to leave us with. And he was talking about, prejudices and injustice and I can't remember exactly how he put it but I mean that two-hour conversation is worth the final five minutes alone where he's basically talking about people who don't tolerate this that and the other people who aren't decent human beings and he's basically like and if you think like that you can go fuck yourself. (laughs) And it's like the most (laughs) amazing send off. And like, I mean, you know, like we, we were, we were quiet, but in awe and in respect, it's like, you have just articulated this so perfectly and so well, and in only a way that Joe R. Lansdale could. So, (laughs) If you haven't heard that conversation, if people listening haven't heard that conversation, you need to because, I mean, Joe Lansdale is so on the money and he does it in typical Lansdale form. Mm-hmm. He's, such a, he's a genuine person. I mean, one of the things that he was talking about last night is, uh, or yesterday afternoon, he, he's, he, he's so... He, it's like he's just so easy going and you could tell he's a genuine person and that allows him to even get away with some like what would, would, would a lot of people would consider off color jokes mm-hmm. it's just the way he talks you know and he was going on about something and he said he goes that's why that's why southern ladies don't like argies because of all the thank you notes you know and you're just like <laughs> oh my god and but at the same time you're like in, in, you're thinking okay how is that joke even disrespectful <laughs> it's not, you know. What I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just a statement, and it's funny. But if you think about it, you're like the only thing that's really throwing that joke off is the word, one word. That's it. That's it. Just one word. But it's not a disrespectful <laughs> statement at all, you know. And it's just, <laughs> and I was like, how, uh, how clever that he can actually just get away with that. And, and of course, I, if I said it, I'd be like, well, golly, I'd be shunned from everywhere, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like it's nothing disrespectful at all, <laughs> you know. And it's just the, it's the way he just rolls it out, you know. He is a, truly a national treasure. Yeah, so funny, so funny. Oh my gosh! And that's why a story like Night They Missed the Horror Show it starts off, uh-huh. and you've got yeah. these absolutely uh-huh. objectionable characters using racist language, and you know, mm-hmm. like. If it wasn't Lansdale, you might have closed the story because you're like, I don't, I don't trust where this is going. I'm feeling 
too uncomfortable, but because it's Joe, you know there's going to be a payoff, you know there's going to be some sort of moral message, you hope to hell that there's going to be some redemption, and, you know, if you haven't read that, you have to keep going, because it is a very satisfying story, but I think not too many writers could could get away with that and could tell it as effectively as Joe does. And it's the kind of thing where you need to absolutely get it right because there's a thin line between telling a really good story and being grossly offensive. But, yeah, I mean, Joe's on the right side of it every time. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go a step further. I, I think that he is the only person alive or dead who could have written that story and done it right um it's night they miss the horror show is one of the finest examples of horror fiction ever ever penned and i think that there are a billion ways to go wrong with that story just like you're talking about right yeah. and and only one way to go right one one definition of genius i like is being able to do what nobody else can do Right. And, and I look at I, in my film class, we study, for example, Jackie Chan. And right. We study Fred, Fred Astaire. And those two performers seem so different. But I think what unifies them is they had a unique form of genius. Nobody could do what Fred Astaire did exactly like he did. Nobody could do what Jackie Chan did precisely like he does. Same way with Joe R. Lansdale. You know, Stephen King's my favorite writer. Stephen King could not have written Night They Missed the Horror Show. Nobody but Lansdale could have written that and nailed it so thoroughly and stuck the landing like you're talking about because the ending of that story is pitch perfect. Yeah. And, and, you know, somebody like Joe, you know, you could, you know, th there are people who are so, you know, dismissive and, and, and jump to judgment. You know, you could read that, you could misread that and, and come to all sorts of negative conclusions. But because Joe, Joe, Joe's not just about tolerance. Joe's about celebrating differences in people, right? And loving people for their differences in, in various ways. And because he comes from that place of such not only tolerance for, for, for all types of people, but, but celebration, unless, of course, they are, you know, cruel and evil and, and, and you, know, um, you know, discriminatory toward people. Those, that's the one thing he doesn't have patience for. But because Joe comes from this place of loving other people's, you know, differences, whatever those are, the story is pitch perfect. It works so beautifully. And it's a, it's a classic of horror fiction. Oh, definitely. Thank you so much for listening to part one of our conversation with Jonathan Jans. Join us again next time for part two when we will be chatting with Jonathan about overcoming fear, being your authentic self, and his new novel, The Siren and the Spectre. Of course, if you want to get that ahead of the crowd if you want to get that before everyone else then all you need to do is become our patron and you can do that over at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror of course if you're a patron at the four dollar level then you get the full conversation in its entirety right now so you get to Pledge four dollars and listen to three and a half hours of conversation with Jonathan Jans. You also get Story Unboxed, the horror podcast on the craft of writing. You get to submit questions for each and every interview, and indeed you get to submit questions for our Q and A sessions where Bob Pastorella and myself answer anything and everything you submit to us. All right, before I wrap up, let us have a quick word from our sponsors. Get ready to indulge in an audio experience that will make your skin crawl and your stomach churn. Sadistic experiments are being carried out in Arlington Asylum, designed to remake our world as a demonic Lovecraftian hellscape. Tormented, from horror author Lee Mountford and narrator Hannibal Hills, is now available as a high-quality audiobook. Search Tormented on Audible or Amazon now. Don't just read horror. Experience it. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? 
good news. Now you can have a St- Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. As always, I would like to end with a quote. And today's quote is from Alice Munro. A story is not like a road to follow. It's more like a house. You go inside and stay there for a while, wandering back and forth and settling where you like and discovering how the room and corridors relate to each other, how the world outside is altered by being viewed from these windows, and you, the visitor, the reader, are altered as well by being in this enclosed space, whether it is ample and easy or full of crooked turns or sparsely or opulently furnished. You can go back again and again and the house, the story, always contains more than you saw the last time. It also has a sturdy sense of itself of being built out of its own necessity, not just to shelter or beguile you. And that is Alice Munro. I'll see you in the next episode for the second part of our conversation with Jonathan Jans. But until then, take care of yourself, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day.